What's up, witches? Welcome to another episode of the Better Witch Podcast, presented by the Modern Witch Network. I'm your host, Allie, aka Bronx Witch. I'm a tarot reader, Reiki healer, and owner of Bronx Witch Headquarters, a spiritual shop and witchy work share space in the Bronx, New York. And I'm going to be coming to you every week with a new topic and perhaps a guest co-host to share our real life experiences and some of the things we've learned as practicing witches. Because when we know better, we witch better. Today's guest co-host is Jenna Matlin. Jenna has been a full-time tarot practitioner since 2012 and was awarded Best of Philly Spiritual Guru by Philadelphia Magazine in 2019. She's also been featured in various online spaces such as BuzzFeed and Bustle. Jenna is the author of three books, Have Tarot Will Party, Have Tarot Will Travel, and the latest, Will You Give Me a Reading, and presents at tarot conferences both domestically and internationally. Jenna enjoys working with clients such as Urban Outfitters and Crate and Barrel, in addition to reading for and teaching tarot enthusiasts around the world. You can find Jenna on Instagram and TikTok at Jenna Matlin and on her website, jennamatlin.com. I guess what I'll uh, kind of go back a little bit with is um, asking you to share with us maybe where you started um, in, in, in tarot and how it first came into your life. And now it's a big part of your career, your profession, your writing. Um, but I imagine that it probably didn't start that way. So what was it like for you getting started when it was so few and far between to meet other readers? Well, I think um, I was psychic before I picked up tarot, and that's its own story. But this story begins, and I can tell you the exact day I had, I got my first tarot deck, because I, it was right after my birthday, and me and my friends were watching, because I'm from California originally, we were watching uh, O.J. Sim Simpson run it on his Bronco. Oh my gosh. The exact day that I got my tarot deck. You were <laughs> like, I gotta pull cards on this. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? What is, uh, he was wow. running, what? Wow. Uh, and uh, so in my neighborhood, and I say this as a very loving, it was a drag queen who gave me my first deck because in my neighborhood, there was a couple of houses of these wonderful men who did drag and they were really into the scene and being a precocious, and slightly like wild teenager, I kind of glommed onto them because I love them. Um, and he bought me my first deck. I was like 14 at the time. So like you around the same age. And then they had a Victor Victoria party that October and they asked me to come read. And so I did and I was hooked. Um, I've done a lot of things. I mean, this of course is not my only like professional career but it was about 12, almost 12 years ago that I <clears throat> was like, you know, this office life is like, a, it's never been really a fit for me. Mm -hmm. So then I really had to think about it. What's the thing I do best out of all the things that people have always said about me? I read tarot really well. Could I make a business of this? Mm. And then I was off and running and it just, self-employment was, like it just was a fit in a way I never understood. And I was like, oh, I'll come to give myself six months. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. Then I'll figure something else out. And it did. Um, and I've just gone, it's like the only time in my life where I just kept hitting green lights. It was like mm. the universe was like, finally, girl, finally, you are where we've been wanting you to be, you know? And it was just like, ding, ding, ding. And I'm not someone for whom I would say, was I was very lucky. Mm. So there was a lot of isolation. Um, and just really, I look back and go, man, how'd she do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> she didn't know she was, she was, like, she's braver than I gave her credit for. Um, yeah. But 
I mean, the online communities and at the time physical conferences were a big thing. And um, I hope that they continue. And I will say to the young readers that you are not doing this alone. You are sitting on the shoulders of people you don't even know who have paved this way in many ways. Mm -hmm. So come to a physical conference and meet these people yeah. because they have so much wisdom, but they're not hanging out on TikTok. They're not doing the snaps. They are not there. And if you want to just soak in the wisdom of these like traditional readers, you've got to go in person, got to go to the conferences, got to be in the places they are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I did. Um, so yeah, it was, it was quite, and it has been quite a ride, but I'm not too worried. Like, I think people get worried about like competition or whatever. Like there's so many readers, how am I gonna? And it's like, you know what? Like if it's, it's hard work, as you know, you know, it's hard all work. Yes. Like you have to love this yes. in order to do this yeah. long term. And if people don't come with the right mindset, they, they'll come and go. Mm -hmm. This is truly a calling. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I've, I've spoken with, with people about that idea before, mm -hmm. like, is it a calling? It, because tarot is uh, methodical, it's, it has a system that has been codified, that has been cemented, there is a certain amount of um, just sort of study that anyone can do. Uh, but I do really, and this is, you know, it's not to make anyone feel like this is not for you. And I actually really love how emphatic you are at the start of your newest book about, yes, do that reading, go ahead and give mm -hmm. that reading. So this is not about making people feel like, no, this is not for you. It's for, you know, the cool kids who were blessed with the oh. golden, <laughs> you know, deck, uh, you know, yeah. upon birth and the rest of you can't do it. It's not about that. It's just that, um, like anything in life, if you are trying to force something to happen, mm. it is going to be so much more difficult than if you surrender to the thing that you're really in alignment with. Mm. And, mm. you know, I think we've all been through that where we're trying to make something work, trying to make something work, and it's like banging your head against the wall. And then when you land on the thing that you're really supposed to be doing, all the roads kind of open up and things just start to fall into place. And if you feel that way about tarot, lean into it, go for it. And that's great advice that a, a big way that you can do that. And that's advice that I'm going to take because I haven't been to a tarot conference and I've wanted to go, um, but my life has kept me from doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make it, um, you know, uh, my business to make sure that I get to a few of these because I think that's a really great way for you to find out whether or not that that calling is there and whether or not you really are in alignment with doing this for others or even just for yourself, but really mm -hmm. doing it regularly and doing it as a practice. I think yeah. that's the type of space where it will become clear to you that like, this is weird. These, these folks are weird. And I, am, I do not care about this as much as they do <laughs> or wow. Here I am surrounded by a bunch of people who really love this and feel called to this the way that I do. What can I learn for them, from mm -hmm. them? So I think that's mm -hmm. great advice um, for all of our audience. Get out yeah. there and go to conferences. And I think you bring a good point. Like, like the calling doesn't always mean that like you're going to be a full-time reader. The right. calling could be like you kind of, this is like a couple, you know, you do with a few people or it's occasional. The call has different levels of volume, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's fun to watch in the tarot community. Like you can just tell like someone new is kind of coming around and I'm like, Oh, who's this person? And then there's something that this clicks and then like kind of fold it in. I'm like, Oh, this is, this is their thing. Yeah. Um, but I think, and what I love about tarot is truly, yeah, it does have this system, but it didn't start off as the system. It was a playing card deck. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. there is a very it was for gambling. <laughs> yeah, very Folks egalitarian. were gambling with them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, so it's from the streets. 
at some yeah. point. Yeah. People were like throwing it down or whether it was with playing cards or tarot deck. And so when you look at these old like oil paintings, you know, there's always this old woman who's reading for people. So people who were um, not literate were reading with cards. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it is very egalitarian, but tarot will meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, I'm just going to take it this way, tarot goes cool. Or it's like, I'm going to be this high ceremonial, you know, Enochian, whatever, whatever. <laughs> okay, cool. We'll be here too, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what I love about it, that mm -hmm. there's so many ways to approach it. And, and my book is just one way. Mm -hmm. um, but my complaint was, that the way I saw people being taught around tarot maybe kept some people in, unable or, or, or even like uncertain if they can approach it or learn it when actually it's a very organic process mm -hmm. if we lean into that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. And I, um, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating um, in learning more about you was the work that you do with larger companies like Urban mm -hmm. Outfitters and things mm -hmm. like that. And I know that, um, you know, we've, there's been some controversy with larger groups or larger businesses like Sephora and things selling smudge kits or starter mm -hmm. witch kits or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious how your relationship with the larger companies um, has been. Have they been open to understanding that tarot is something that folks take seriously, that some people might even consider sacred or, um, you know, a, a really deep part of like their spiritual practices? And how open have they been to like hearing your guidance um, in so that? Like, I think when I think of large companies, like, say, Urban Outfitters, like, I know individuals within Urban Outfitters, mm -hmm. and I've been hired by individual departments. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a hydra that different departments are doing different things based off of the philosophy of probably whoever is leaving, leading the department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I never work with, like, departments that were just trying to capitalize on a moment. Those were not the places I was really doing work. I was really doing work with people who did see value in it mm -hmm. um, and wanted to make that available to both their employees and to also the events that they were doing. So I never, I never felt anything but like actual respect to my face, at least. I don't know if they were saying behind my, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and and a desire to truly learn um i had never so i was never in a position where that was actually as much of a problem as small mom and pop companies mm. did not treat me with a lot of respect right. wanting me to work for exposure or like come to my halloween event i had this recently a big big museum in the area where i live oh, we would love to have a professional reader like you come to our Halloween event. We have like 500 tickets that sell. La -da 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 -da. Great. So um, what's your budget? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, no, no, girl. You're supposed to come for free. We'll give you a table and chairs. And I'm like, you let me grab my calculator. Do, do, do my little abacus. <laughs> You're going to make this amount of money. And you said you want a professional reader, yet you will not treat me professionally. Right. You are going to put the risk all on me. And they're like, oh, and you can't charge. Oh, and you can't ask for tips. But maybe you can sell some merch. Hmm. That, for me, is deeply personally offensive. Yeah. And I let people have it. <laughs> I do. Yeah, no, good, good, absolutely. I just, the other day I reposted something. I was like, if you... Um, you don't put up a fence around your house in the middle of the desert. Like you only put up boundaries when you have something worth protecting and you have some abundance that has value. And so um, setting up boundaries is a way of saying what I have is valuable. Um, and so go, go, go girl. Well, thank <laughs> you. Them know. Yes, absolutely. Also, I mean, and that's why, again, we're, we're getting to that place where there probably will be a professional body of advocates 
because a lot of readers may also, they're like, well, I'm just dabbling. I'll, I'll go read for free. And then, then that expectation is set that that's what you can get from readers. Mm -hmm. So there has been over the years, this schism between pro readers and like hobbyists. Yeah. So that's a whole other conversation. But I tell readers, you've got to be like paid for your time. But it wasn't always like that. Like when I started, there was this loud drumbeat about you don't you don't charge for spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Other people feel very guilty about it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't I don't even hear about that anymore ever, except maybe in some Facebook groups, you know, yeah. but um, so that you also have that piece. And and like you said, the, the, the changes of what this industry, what it means to read tarot, how does that look is really in flux. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to watch. It really is. And um, I like that you mentioned uh, that idea because I too heard that quite a bit when I uh, was just reading for myself. You know, it it didn't, people, do, I don't even know if people believe me when I say this, but um, when I first started my magical journey, tarot is a, a, a divination a part of my overall spiritual and magical practice. And when that started for me, it was the late 90s, you know, early 2000s, the internet was still getting to be what it is. And um, I was underage. So uh, covens and things like that were not available to me. Um, conferences and things were not available to me. And so I kind of gave up on finding community, finding information and things like that online. You know, I read all the Cunningham books and I read all the bit. Yeah. And once I was done with that, I was like, I'm good. I'm going to go do my own thing. And that was beautiful. That actually turned out to be super, super beautiful because rather than filling my library with every tarot book and tons of decks, I had one deck and I had like two guidebooks. And then I was by myself and tarot was just something that I did for myself. And I grew in my understanding of its accuracy and my abilities as a reader for myself before I ever even thought of reading for other people. And then fast forward to about 2019, I'm in the hospitality industry, I'm managing restaurants, I think I'm going to own bars in New York City and you know I'm gonna use magic to help me get there but not professionally. And, uh, and then COVID happens and I'm on the internet way more than I used to be and I realize that there's this whole witching world that grew on the internet in that like 15 year span that I had no idea was there. And I was like, wait a minute, people are like making a living from reading tarot and <laughs> that is wild. Um, and then began to learn about how I could, you know, share my services with the world and have the internet help me with that and things like that. But I started out in the world of you don't charge for spiritual gifts. These are things that you do um, because you are the local town seer and, uh, <laughs> you know, folks come to you for that. Um, and there were a lot of other myths um, mm -hmm. that that kind of either existed back then or have come to be now. And I actually wanted to talk to you about some of those myths because I feel like some of them um, – can can be hang-ups for folks or stop um, new folks not from reading for others we'll we'll, we'll come back to to that because we're going to get really into your book and talk about reading for other people and things that folks should be keeping in mind and considering um, either before they do that or, or as they embark on that journey but just picking up that first deck there are some myths just around that that mm -hmm. i would love to get your take on and the big one is that you need to be gifted your first deck mm -hmm. um, because you were gifted yours, but mm -hmm. I bought mine from a Barnes and Noble. <laughs> no, I, I didn't have the forty dollars at the time. <laughs> you know, I would have bought it. You would have bought it, right? <laughs> so, um, and I have been trying so much to figure out where this myth came from, or. Mm -hmm. uh, Perhaps myth is a hard word because maybe some people really feel very strongly that in fact that is 
how it should be done and they might have really serious traditional or spiritual reasons as to why they feel that way so um forgive me folks if myth seems like a, a heavy word to use um but for me it doesn't ring true um that 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 is going to increase your skills or make anything better or that you are somehow putting a jinx on yourself or on your reading um yeah. by buying your first deck or anything like that so do you have some insight into like where that came from or why people feel that way and certainly yeah. if you agree or not well i i want to backtrack real quick because you know we say this idea that if you charge then your spiritual gifts are going to be taken from you mm. and i'm like well then it's not a gift then is it right <laughs> it's supposed to be mine <laughs> gift and have strings attached because mm. then it's like oh then we're talking about coercion Mm. Okay, well then, what's who and what is coerced? Where right. is this? You know, coercion. Or is this a loan? It's like a conditional, yeah. loan, like does right. it on loan to me? Um, I on my TikTok, I did a whole series of this of like mm. debunking these belief sets that may not be valuable or helpful. And then now this week, I've been doing debunking, like really talking about boundaries. Like you, just because someone knows you read tarot and they're like, give me your reading. Uh, that doesn't still, you don't have to give them a reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because they know doesn't mean you're obligated to mm -hmm. give them a reading, right? So um, in terms of the, of the, I don't know, like, and you pose a really good question. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to deep dive in some of the historical books that I have around that. Um, like my, my spidey senses are like, I need to check out, I'm looking on my, my, bookshelf like eden gray's mm. um tarot book from the late 70s mm -hmm. like i definitely want to go hmm is that there mm. because it's not in anything that's ever been written from rachel pollack mary greer and that's that's another thing like if you want to read tarot there are key books throughout history which really like left its mark on how people read tarot it's a really good idea to 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 read those, grab those online and in the hard, old hard copies and read them because you'll see that the art of tarot is, it's like a Frankenstein. It's an amalgam mm -hmm. of things that shift and change over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that a lot with the court cards. Like the jump, historically, tarot, when it was the Marseille system, right? I, the more I read about it, the more I'm like, man, tarot got co-opted by the Golden Dawn folks, you know, like <laughs> it got co-opted and they kind of like spiritual bypassed a lot of stuff on here, right? Yeah. That when I keep the Marseille in mind, it makes for a more honest reading. So the lovers isn't this like ordained by an angel. The lovers is, you know, why is he coming home so late? <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. and that, and that the hangman is not this like virtuous, whatever it's the traitor mm -hmm. and like you were saying at the beginning of our talk that it's it's a it's a card game which is why the magician is just the street magician sometimes the magician doesn't show up as like the force of your will right. and your power into and the world all it's of like, the elements it's yeah, like david it's like, copperfield <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was like oh this is a shell game mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so yeah. You know, that's why I'm like, we've got to look at the history of, of the stories that are told. What's interesting, and I think what has really added a lot of fuel to the fire of tarot was the ability for tarot deck creators to kickstart their decks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That really revved things up. And a lot of energy is put into decks. However, who's really calling the shots about how people see tarot is from the books. And there's not a lot. And maybe like, you know, because I've done that dive and I've done that research, I'm like, we, we've got to like do more of an analysis here. Hmm. Um, like in Marseille, Queen of Wands, uh, the Queen of Wands in the Marseille looks more like today's Queen of Pentacles. Hmm. She's shifted. Because it wasn't, well, maybe I think Attila started playing around with this, but it really wasn't until the RWS and even like the Toth, you know, like 
that there was this hyper desire to make everything fit. So they created all these correspondences, as you know. Yeah. Well, the Queen of Wands, she shifted when she also became the Queen of Fire. Mm. Because in the Marseille, the suits are based on social class, not elements. Right. So Queen of Wands was just the country woman. Right. You know, she was she was she was at the farmers market. <laughs> and maybe she'll have a roll in the hay with you. You know, we're yeah, having fun yeah, over yeah. here. Right. right? But then she became this fiery, feisty. Like, and so when we see the history, I think it like empowers us mm -hmm. to be like, there is no ultimate truth. Yeah. And if there is no ultimate truth, then what is true for me? Yeah. And I like that you mentioned that because in uh, in Will You Give Me a Reading, you talk about uh, like the cultural differences of things like timing, oh, yeah. um, you know, monochronic and polychronic timing. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I thought that was so fascinating and something that as a Westerner, I don't even, you know, necessarily really think about a lot about how other cultures think about time totally differently. Um, and so that can have an impact on the way we read, if we are a deck creator, how we create our decks and how each card relates to each other, um, whether or not the cards even speak to time frames, because um, that's something that some readers do and other readers do not, where mm -hmm. they can say, okay, this card indicates that this will happen in a couple of months versus in a couple of years. And some mm -hmm. readers don't apply that at all. They go more of, well, if this occurs, then this will happen. And if that doesn't occur, then this will happen. And when is dependent on the first thing. And um, um, so all of these changes and cultural influences that have fed into what we just now kind of just call tarot um, matter. Um, and so I do think that that's where we get these myths from as well because I too don't really know exactly where the uh, you need to be gifted a deck thing came from. But what I have heard some folks speculate about is going back to the origins of playing cards and the priciness of getting your hands on a deck it was not something that you could just pick up for two dollars in a corner store that came much much later originally printing on paper was very expensive decks were often printed blank on one side just because printing on two sides was just like whoa astronomical mm -hmm. um in in cost and so to be given a deck was a really big deal because it would not have been a cheap or incidental gift and so perhaps this idea that being gifted a deck is something super special kind of mm. got warped into well it's not special if you don't gift it to yourself that seems i've heard more than one person say maybe that's where it's from Mm -hmm. And I am not as as well researched as you are on the history of the evolution of uh, just cards in general. So, yeah. you know, I don't but that that's what I've heard. So per, perhaps that's what it is, that it started out as being gifted a deck was a really big deal. Um, mm -hmm. And if it, if it was gifted to you, it was it was by someone who cared about you. And certainly if they gifted it to you for the purpose of divination, this would have been a very special person because it wasn't used for div divination mm -hmm. widely for mm -hmm. a long time. So someone who was using it that way would have been running in very small circles. Yeah. Um, and so it would have been, you know, a very almost sacred type of gift to be given. Yeah. And then from that, people sort of extrapolated that, well, it's very not special if you buy mm -hmm. it for yourself. I think that's an interesting theory. I, I like, what, don't give me another thing to put on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go to research this now. I know. Right? Like, what is you know, this but, coming from? Like, but, you, but you see, like, what you're talking about, you see it in the Lenormand, right? The Lenormand mm -hmm. deck, which has an inserted playing card because it, was, could, it could be used as two different things. Right. But tarot was not really used as a divination system until much later. Playing cards were used as a divination system. And then mm -hmm. kind of it got mashed up uh, around, yeah. you know, Attila's time. Mm -hmm. But I think, the, you know, I think when it's women or any kind of marginalized community that is doing it, yeah. it often is ignored or flies under the radar until it gets a nod by whoever is in power. Right. And so usually the person in power who does that first nod is also co-opting it at the same time, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So when we start seeing people writing about 
tarot and stuff. These are white men of privilege. Mm -hmm. This isn't the woman or whoever, you know, down getting that reading over here. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that knowledge either got lost or continues to be word of mouth through time. This is why I'm going to come back. It's important for everyone to come and listen to our most wise crones and tarot because all of it is not going to be in writing yeah and we got to preserve it it's important Mm. yeah yeah and you mentioned um that when marginalized groups and women you know specifically are uh, up to anything um (laughs) it, it it either gets brushed under and kind of ignored until it gets that stamp of approval from you know white male society or even worse it gets vilified Mm -hmm. and made out to be something demonic something secretive something scary and that's another myth that i wanted to touch on um, that i hear quite a bit particularly from people who are coming from religious backgrounds christian backgrounds in particular this idea that card reading can open you up to a whole world of evil and everything from demonic possession to opening portals in your bedroom. I mean, I've heard all types of things from people who mean very well and are like, Ali, Mm -hmm. I want to read cards. I was gifted a deck or I just feel really drawn to tarot or I watch tons of videos on YouTube. I just love everything about it. But I'm afraid because I've been told that if I start reading tarot, I'm going to open my life up to all types of spiritual and paranormal activity. Um, has that happened for you? Have you opened any portal portals to the underworld in the middle of a reading? Uh, I have <laughs> opened portals to the underworld, but they were pretty. They're pretty nice. They were right. pretty nice. It actually You're worked right. out. It worked out yeah. okay. Yeah, but you know, it's interesting what you were saying that, like, you know, I read somewhere, saw it maybe on TikTok. I don't know. It was like. It wasn't witches that were burned. It was women that were burned. Yes. It was women. Yes. And women who didn't fall into the patriarchal whatever, whatever is mm-hmm. right. But um, portals, it's funny. I just talked about that on my socials a couple of days ago. And the, I have two things I want to share, like I just that come to mind, which mm-hmm. is, so if we read the Bible, right, like that God <laughs> – I'm still freaking out around that story about um, like Lot, you know, Mm. and I'm like, that is nuts if you think about it. So basically these angels come to town and all the villagers, the townsmen and whatever were like, we want to rape and sodomize these angels because they're so beautiful. And then Lot goes, oh, no, no, have my daughters instead. He like brings the angels in. He shoves his daughters out like, good luck. Mm -hmm. And then God goes, you're all right. I'm going to put a conflagration on this town mm-hmm. and I'm going to let you and your family run. Okay, great. So him, his wife and those daughters, I don't even know how they got up to run after all that. Right. They're running and they're just like, don't look back. If you look, if you look back, you're going to turn into a pillar of salt. Well, the wife looks back, she turns into a pillar of salt. What do we learn from this story? <laughs> that rape and all of that horribleness is okay. If God tells you to, but don't you look back because God told you not to. Like, what a sociopath. (laughs) I mean it, though. I'm sorry to offend. That's the same person who's also saying, don't read tarot? Right, right. Well, I mean, the very first episode of this season's podcast is with Reverend Valerie Love, who is absolutely fantastic. And um, not that I haven't given you enough homework, but also check out (laughs) Reverend Valerie Love. Um, She is the author of How to Be a Christian Witch and like 18 or 20 other books all around the topic of witchcraft and Christianity, witchcraft in the Bible, and all of the instances of divination, of astrological prophecy, uh, and things like that, um, that happen in the Bible uh, sanctioned by God or, uh, you know, apparently that's the only reason we knew that Jesus was being born was because somebody was paying attention to the stars. Um, So great. Yeah. So the it, it, it is unfortunate that there is this 
narrative out there that tarot is somehow evil or demonic or uh, you know somehow goes against what you may hold true in terms of your inner values that you may have learned in your life from your religion or from your spiritual path um, because I have found it to be nothing but the opposite Oh, yeah. It's, on, it's only brought good things into my life, positivity into my life. It's only helped me grow as mm-hmm. a person. Um, and to now be doing it to help others is like, wow, it's an incredible to be in a place of service um, all around this thing that some people, you know, truly think might open up their lives to just the worst. So it's very interesting that that yeah. is, um, yeah. that is and- out there. Yeah, and that like brings me to the second point I wanted to mention, which is if, if the devil made this deck and was like, ha-ha, this is how I'm going to get you, why would he make himself a bad guy in his own deck? Yeah, good point. Good <laughs> point. I never really thought about that. Yeah. Right? He wouldn't even have put himself in there at all. It would be like, I'm not even a conversation. Yeah. Right? And then you also have judgment, which is basically Gabriel blowing his horn and people being raptured to heaven. And that is at the end of the story of the major arcana. This Mm -hmm. is like you like beat the final boss. And this is like, this is the promised land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how is it like, what kind of mental gymnastics does one need to do when you look at actually the story, but Mm -hmm. go like, no, it's just a massive trick. Like if the, if the devil is a bad guy in the right. deck. Right, right. And there's so much reference to, I mean, there are so many angel references mm-hmm. in, in the imagery, at least uh, of the RWS. And, uh, but, but also um, in other styles as well, references to, to biblical ideas, to ideologies that are in very much in alignment with mm-hmm. what we see from the Judeo-Abrahamic uh, practices. So it, it's, it's interesting that that's out there, but I do want to dispel that for folks who are listening, watching, and are worried that, you know, oh no, my interest in tarot might take me down a path of darkness or a path of harm or destruction that um, I can say, and I, I hear Jenna echoing, that it's it's only brought positivity into our lives. And so there's... Right. And, and here's the thing, the devil can right. come, and, you know, like darkness can come to anyone. I mean, look at all the issues that we've had with clergy. Mm. They weren't protected, were they? Like, Mm-mm. so to me, I'm less interested in what is the name of that old time religion or whatever. I'm interested in, are you living true to your own core values? Are you being a person of service in the world mm-hmm. in alignment with those values? then that's where I'm looking at. Yeah. Because I, like, there are just so many religions in the world. And I don't know. I just feel like, but what is endemic to all of them are these values of love and truth and compassion. Yeah. (laughs) That's where I'm interested in staying. Whatever we want to slap a label on that. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, I think it's time to have a break. What do you think? I think so. That's a perfect segue into talking specifically about your book, which I want to do. Everyone, will you give me a reading? Got your copy handy? Okay, good, because we are going to do some some uh, creative reading here. I'm going to read a passage because (laughs) let me just tell you. So first of all, I am like on page like 95 or something. Um, I just I just got my hands on the copy a, a couple weeks ago, and Jenna, I am 
in love. Aww, I am you. in love. So I just want to take a moment to just gush for a second about this book, um, about your decision to write it. Um, I will be honest that my first, um, so I went through an emotional roller coaster when I first heard about it, right? At first, I was like, oh, a book about how to actually give readings as opposed to the typical the ace of wands means this and the, you know with, and those books are great they're very important and they're helpful and symbology is great to learn and whatever but i was like oh this is new this is different this is great mm -hmm. and then i immediately went oh no now everyone and their mama really is going to be tarot reading yes. and i had this moment of panic of like shit can we trust people with this information can we <laughs> is it going to be because and i'll be honest my, i was a little bit worried about like is it just tips and tricks for how you can become a reader real fast? You know, you know? I had that. I had that in the in the ninth, tenth hour. I reached mm -hmm. out to their tarot author, and I was like, "Oh, I can't, I can't do this because I'm just going to teach the bad readers." Who yeah, want to do like how to, how, how to how to fake it, right? So that's what I was worried about, and I was like, I was like, "Oh no!" And then I started reading, and I was like, "Oh." She's got us. We're good. Because you immediately start the book from what I consider a really beautiful place um, of um, empathy, setting boundaries, um, and dealing with criticism. And I immediately was like, okay, if you are phony baloney, if you are doing this because you want to get rich quick, or you think this is going to be your ticket to having the next famous mm. Instagram page or what have you, you are immediately going to be bored and not interested and put this down because you start the book off with the internal work of what it means to be in service of other people mm -hmm. and what that must mean then for your self-analysis of who you are mm -hmm. and whether or not you are ready to deal with some of the challenges of being in service to mm -hmm. people who are coming from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, and maybe in like really bad places in their lives or really struggling, um, not receptive, not knowledgeable, whatever the case may be. Um, if you are just in it for the money or you're just in it for the fame, you are not interested in doing that introspective work. And I love that you start right out the gate with that. Um, and, and also that you make it uh, accessible. So for those of us who are serious, it's, it's, it, you're not going to have to necessarily go on a 35 year Jungian journey in order to, <laughs> you know, build boundaries or know how to be empathetic um, to your client or to yourself, even whoever you're reading. Mm -hmm. But you are going to want to do some work. Um, you are going to need to do some work. And then you use the tarot itself to help us do that. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and, you know, when you've been reading for a little while, you don't necessarily do the exercises and things that you read in a book. You just kind of read it to read or whatever. I was like, oh, where's my deck? Because I have never looked at myself like this. And oh. it was so great. I'm really, really loving it. Um, so I'm so glad that, that you have written this book. And I was curious about your your motivation this book and your other books because uh, you know have tarot will travel have tarot will party mm -hmm. i love the idea of writing books from the perspective of okay here's how you do it mm -hmm. you know here's how you do it we can talk all day about the symbolism of the imagery about you know what the cards mean and and all of these things and spreads and all of that stuff but how do you actually get over that hurdle of doing it um, for yourself or for other people? And um, what what do you think is your motivation there to be so focused on the reader and giving us tools and skills for doing the work of reading? Um, so I, it says a lot about who, you are mm. to mention the empathy part mm. and the boundaries part and if if i didn't know who you were at all the fact that that was the piece you brought up would have told me what i need to know about you mm. and about that you are coming from a place of service too and coming from a place of really wanting people to be okay and 
I think that there are many readers, myself included, and this may be why we're attracted to these weird things, because we were minimized in life, whether it was in our family systems or we were bullied or whatever. And have you that- been talking to my therapist? <laughs> I was like, all right, give me the scoop. Because uh, you know, that's spot but, on, yeah. But it's true. And mm-hmm. that people that become readers are often so hungry for others to not suffer. Mm. That it's really mm-hmm. endemic to who they are. Um of course, you get the narcissists who come in here and just like to feel like they're better than everybody. But you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> uh, but for for people for whom suffering is something that they have a special antenna for. I'm going to get emotional. A lot of readers are very mm. much like that. And I wanted to help them. Mm. Because if they were like me, they didn't have anybody. Mm. And they had to figure it out and they were scared or they were harmed or they were taken advantage of or whatever, either as a person or as a reader. And if I can help that not be that, then that's always been such a huge motivator for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's a lot easier to write books for the masses, like the, the, Mm -hmm. the, the general person than it is other readers. Um, but I had experiences starting off with my business where I was harmed and taken advantage of, but because I was a tarot reader, right, uh, who's going to come protect me? Like, Mm -hmm. and I never wanted anyone to have to feel like that. Yeah. Um, and also though, like, I hope I would love to see a publication for people who see readers. This is what you're looking for. This is what you should expect. And, you know, this is the, this is the, you know, the bar for entry because I see it happen on both sides. Both readers get harmed and querents or clients get harmed. Mm -hmm. Um, So in a roundabout way, that's why I've written these books because I felt there was a need for them. Yeah. And, And um, I never, I want, and I want people to be better readers and have a language and a framework for that. Cause I'll see readers sometimes too, like some stuff that I'll hear, I'll hear readers, you know, like I really did push back on that whole, like, oh, don't gatekeep tarot. Blah, blah. And I'm like, well, but if you're trying to say that that person, A, who just opened a deck this week and maybe she or they or he or whatever is super intuitive and like it's a hit for them that's valid but don't try to say that that person is the same as someone who's been reading full-time for 10 years right but that's what i've heard and i'm like oh really (laughs) now you know um so there's that piece and i've also heard readers say things like whatever comes out of my mouth is being channeled and i'm like that is so dangerous Mm -hmm. you have to monitor yourself you have to be able to quickly identify what is a psychic hit? What's an intuitive hit? What's a gut hit? They're right. all different. Mm-hmm. What's your opinion? Because you're triggered. Because right. her ex's name, you know, <laughs> Tyrone, and so was yours. And you're feeling yeah. some kind of way about it. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And also, like, your own bias. And so if you're not watching that, you're then taking consent and agency and power from the person you're actually really wanting to serve. Yeah, I I love, and you mentioned consent in the book and you're like, you're gonna get tired of me mentioning consent. And I was like, nope, keep, (laughs) keep, keep it up. Keep talking about that because um, like it, your, I was that kid all alone with my diary and my deck. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I did did not have an emotional support system as a kid. Um, I was social in school. I was always friendly and talkative and all of that. And that one, you know, that did well for me. Um, But it was very alone in here and in here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of 
what I do now comes from a place of not wanting people to feel alone. I've created a shop and work share space for witches to come and read together and do services together and do uh, offer their their community and events and things here because I don't want the next witch to feel as alone as I did, especially knowing the truth that there are so many people like us out there. Um, so if you can't find them in your family and your friend group or in your near community, that, that we do still exist even if you don't see us. And I feel like that comes through so strongly with every page of your book is yeah. this desire to want anyone who is reading professionally or otherwise to just know that they are not alone and there is support out there for what you are doing and there is a way to go about learning more about this this beautiful divination practice this beautiful tool uh the tarot deck um that is ethical and supportive and um, helpful, like genuinely helpful to you. And then you can pass that on to people who might come to you um, for reading. So I felt that really, really strongly. And I I wanted to read a a short quote um, from the book because you touched on a little bit about People saying, you know, everything in this message is channeled or, uh, you know, yeah. all, all everything that I just said is Jesus himself um, speaking through me. And um, I, I kind of like how you define it because I think there's, you know, there's that far extreme. And then there are readers who are like, the cards are talking. Uh, the cards are giving messages. The cards, the cards, the cards. And that doesn't sit as well with me either because they are pieces of cardboard with pictures on them and we do need to remember that that they tap us into something deeper but on their own and that kind of harkens back to people who you know have get kicked out of their homes because they have a tarot deck in their in their bedroom um this idea that just the deck itself is this mystical thing um it does not feel correct either and so i like how you described it where you said um Uh, As much as I wish I could take all the credit, I must concede that something beyond my pay grade is at work. Honestly, I try not to think about what it is as much as listen for how it works. I don't want to try to nail the magic down too much. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really liked the way that you did that because I think it makes it clear that when you are giving a reading to yourself or to anyone else you are tapping into something that is greater than us but let's not get caught up in the idea that we are not human people with our own opinions our own biases and things like that and begin to think that everything that occurs to us in the course of a reading is something divine or Mm -hmm. is something mystical and um so i like that you just sort of left it as like there's an it here there's something bigger than us at play here and you can fill in the blanks if you have perhaps some religious or spiritual tradition where you feel like okay the it is this being or the it is the spirit Mm -hmm. or the it is god or the universe or whatever you want to do but we also need to remember that we are human beings serving other human beings and we are going to be limited as a result of that and so let us not take all the credit as you say and think that this is some you know divine experience that we are having it having that is completely not influenced by the fact that I got cheated on my by my boyfriend and I have a particular thorn in my side about infidelity. And so when I see that in a reading, I might get really upset about that or really emphatic about what you should do about that. Mm-hmm. And I need to check that. Mm-hmm. I need to realize that there's an it that helped me to see from the image on this card that someone in your life is being unfaithful but I've got to check my human desire to want to tell you to go break up with him right now <laughs> um, because that might not be there. Um, and or that- you, can, you can say it, you know, but mm-hmm. like be really clear which hat you're, you're, it's coming from for the querent and just be yeah. like, listen, this is, this is me putting this hat on. And so, and can I share it with you? Mm-hmm. Because that's the thing, like I encourage anybody, go to a new age festival fair where there's a lot of readers, 
and go hang out where the food court is. Usually there's a place where snacks are. Go and try to eavesdrop on what people are telling their friends about the readings that they've had. Mm. And you'll hear this kind of stuff like, oh, well, I just felt like she was just giving me her opinion. Yes. And they feel very disempowered by that. Mm -hmm. And so it is a very heady kind of thing to feel like you can come in and, and people people are showing up in their most vulnerable selves often when they get a reading because it's often fear like the the you know i have an intake that when people are like what are you here for baba you know the two words that are used over and over again with almost every like 90 percent of the time is clarity and hope Mm. now if we think about hope and we think about kind of like the feelings wheel right like they're wanting hope that means they have the opposite of hope inside of them the opposite of hope is despair. And so people are like wanting to have, to be empowered and to feel that there's something greater than the suffering that they're in. This is huge. Mm -hmm. This is huge. Mm -hmm. And so we should not be playing fast or loose with hope. Yeah. And, um, Oh yeah. So if we're just like giving our opinion and blah, 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 we're not actually aligning them to what truly is hopeful in the universe for them. Mm -hmm. And people feel very um, unheard. I mean, even in the mental health fields, like there's a crisis happening in that, you know, people are feeling like they're needing something and they're not getting it. People call hotlines and warm lines. And, and so we have to be careful, not just to toss off a pithy, little thing at them but to really be in a place of service also understanding that consent is important and to really monitor ourselves for the voice that's arising within us and we're not going to get this is and this is why people don't stay in the industry for long Mm. this is why it's really hard intricate work and why after a few hours of it, you feel like you're, you've been run over. Yeah. It is a lot of processing on many levels. Um, so I think we have to get honest with what's really going on within us, not to indict ourselves or to even shame ourselves, but to be like, all right, like, like when I take care of myself better and love myself better, then I become a better reader too. Mm-hmm. Like the only way through is love. And I believe that. Mm -hmm. And I see it over and over again. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a um, psychic tarot reader that I follow. And he often reminds folks because of the way they word their questions. It will be, should I break up this relationship? Should I take this? And he's all, should is not a psychic question. (laughs) <laughs> and he's very clear and he's like if you'd like my advice as a human being i'm happy to share my advice with you but i need you to understand that this is not a psychic download it is not an intuitive hit it is not reflected in the cards i can tell you um what those things are but the question of should you then go and do this or that based on that information is a personal decision that you need to make and i can only give my personal opinion Mm -hmm. about it and if you'd like that then that's that's fine and that's kind of how tarot readers also become sort of maybe advisors to people a little bit too because then we also can maybe say well you know Personally, I, I don't think that's a great idea, you know, and this is, the cards don't say that. They say mm-hmm. that if you go this way, this could happen. If you go that way, that could happen. I would choose this way. and But because you've asked and because I've been clear that this is my personal opinion and how I might handle this situation, I can share this with you. Um, but I, but there, there is a danger of conflating those two things. And I think your book does a great job of pulling those two things apart and constantly reminding us that when we do that, when we conflate those two things, we take consent away from the client or the querent. And by doing that, we are no longer in service to them. We're in service right. of to our own needs or to our own interests right. being expressed. And that's not the same. That's not the motivation yeah. um, that we want to have if, if we're going to do this work for real. Yeah, that actually brings me back to the point I was trying to get to. <laughs> but, but 
it, it is a heady job. And if you don't check yourself, it's very easy to kind of lean into this more narcissistic place of like, oh, I'm always right. I'm 95% accurate, blah, blah, blah. Because people always say, oh my God, you're so helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this echo chamber where then you never question yourself. And that takes that takes power away. So, right. So the person shows up in their most vulnerable place. That was where we're finally getting back to that point where they're scared. Yeah. There's despair. There's anxiety driving them to the reading. But we as readers are showing up as our most competent selves. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot acknowledge the power dynamic inherent in that moment right. and like really be very loving and careful to make it a more egalitarian approach where we're really, they're the bosses. Well, we have a couple of bosses. They're one of them. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? Um, but also there's, there's boundaries with that too, which is you know, are you gonna are you gonna tell me that I'm gonna die? No, well, you know, I'm not. I'm not gonna go looking for things that you're not. That's not helpful for for you, or that feels wrong for my core values. Mm -hmm. And two, um, I'm really like, yeah, you're gonna die. We all are. But you know what? I'm actually more interested in, and I did this for. I do this every year. It's called Death Spiral, and it's a spread in a guided meditation where I take people to the moment of their deaths and mm. who shows up for you? Who's going to walk you over? Who, who's going to get in the boat with you? Mm. Um, what, what are you leaving behind? What have you maybe completed? What still needs work? And so to me, that's what gets me up in the morning is, and are those, and people get scared like, Oh, I don't know. And then it's like actually so loving and beautiful when we do it. So, um, but you know, as readers, though, just because we are in service to our querents, that doesn't mean that we do whatever it is that they want us to do. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be really clear with our, with our words. We've got to use our words to be like, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. Yeah. Um, so that they know but all you know readers too like with that like we want to come in and help that we're really attuned to suffering sometimes that can bleed over into codependence and we need to watch that mm. and and that was a really like i'm, I'm gonna say maybe a controversial opinion or if, as you can tell i'm a little contra like i call god a sociopath i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that story is very sociopathic I'm right not right kidding. uh but um where like what was I saying? I just lost it. Um, like, uh, oh yes. So, what's the difference between an empath and someone who's codependent? Mm. Because I see those two terms being used interchangeably, and that's really problematic. And the reason why is people are innately empathic. But codependence, you can change. Yeah. You can learn how to show up and like think in new ways, in different ways. So when people conflate codependence, when I see, oh, the narcissist and empath, well, narcissism is an actual DS5 category. You could be diagnosed for right, it. Right, right. Empath is not. Right. What you typically see is codependence and um, narcissism. And so when we're people pleasers or we, we can't handle the distress that someone else has, we might like sell our, ourselves or sell our values in order to make that distress okay. Yeah. And, and that is part of this whole week of boundaries that I've been talking about. It is not your job to make your queer happy that you can't always sometimes it's a tough message and and like either we trust the cards or we don't mm -hmm. and we can deliver it with as much compassion and empathy but we can't change the message yeah and so we've got to watch that like you know because a lot of readers were rescuers we want to help mm -hmm. but sometimes that means we may make the boundaries very porous in our desire to help 
So we've got to watch that and really look at what is me as empath and what might be some codependent behaviors that I was groomed for from childhood, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, right, exactly. You know I mean? That my so, trauma like, has led me to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so again, that self-monitoring, because those boundaries help check that. Mm-hmm. And at least it does for me. Yeah. I have to tell myself, all right, uh, this person is upset, like I delivered it as carefully, and I, I have to let them process that. And I have to be okay with their uncomfortable emotions and not take them on, but hold space with, with kindness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like that you um, mention the, the power uh, dynamic and the fact that you as the reader are in your highest expression as a reader you're you're you know sitting there with all this confidence and these tools that you know how to use and understand a language that the other person may be completely foreign to them Mm -hmm. and they are coming to you with a whole heap of worry and concern and fear um and distress about whatever it is that they are going through and um it's funny one thing uh but i i like thinking about like body language and different Mm. things like that and how Mm. that impacts people. And I think maybe because I'm a short person, uh, I'm only five feet tall. So I tend to like always be looking up at like what people are doing and people are not Mm. necessarily looking down for me and Mm -hmm. taking like concern about like what's happening below them. Um, But when when folks get readings from me in person, um, I situate my chair lower than theirs. Um, so that they are slightly higher than me. Um, this was something that I, that I picked up, not from a tarot background at all. I think I first heard, um, first heard it as I went to law school for a couple of years Mm -hmm. and they talked about, uh, in one class, like the layout of a courtroom and how it is designed to accomplish certain things psychologically. And there is a reason why the judges sit up very, very high, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. almost ridiculously high off of the ground. You have to go upstairs just to sit um, in in the, the, the judge's bench often. Um, and why that is and then why the jury is situated where it is slightly above the defendant and et cetera, et cetera. And um, that the psychology of how that room is laid out uh, made an impression on me. And Mm -hmm. so I take stock of that, I think, in physical spaces where if I realize that I am seated above someone, I want to try to figure out a way to switch my chair or Mm -hmm. lean back or in Mm -hmm. some way bring myself at least to eye level with Mm -hmm. the other person so that they realize that like, I am another human being just like you, and I just simply happen to have spent the time studying, learning, working with this mm-hmm. particular tool. And for you, you may really know your way around a curling iron or a car engine, and I would be totally, totally lost. Um, and so there's no reason for me to like, you know, lord over you because you're already coming into this with this idea that I've got some power that um, that you don't. And so. Um, that, that was a little trick that I yeah. learned over the years. I, I will drop my, I have this fit, cute little chair so here, and I drop my chair down when yeah. it's time for reading so that oh, I'm yeah. below them because it's this is your reading. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the whole point of us being here is for you to walk away feeling like you have answers. This is not for me. Um, I should not walk away from this feeling like, ah, I just did an amazing job or, you know, and it's, it's okay to recognize like, wow, that was amazing. I'm that, that was great that that happened. Or, uh, I'm so glad that I've been studying for so long and I understood what to say in that moment or what have you, but you shouldn't be walking away feeling like you won something. The, the other person should feel like they won something and that something should be, clarity or an alleviation of despair, hope, um, as you said, some type of guidance or uh, just more certainty about mm-hmm. where where they're moving. It's so interesting that you say that. Like uh, yesterday, I had a routine, like um, medical, it wasn't procedure, but like a, like a, like a test. And um, I was laying like in a bed so they could do like an ultrasound and 
then the ultrasound person leaves and I'm like, nye, 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 like, oh, like, oh, yeah, like, oh, yeah. and then the doctor comes in and she immediately goes, everything's fine. So first thing she says as she's walking and not even like, hello, how are you? She was like, I'm going to cut your anxiety as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing out of my mouth. And I noticed, cause I'm still laying in this like bed that she was standing and, you know, talking to me and I'm like this, but she was not standing straight she went like this with her feet that dropped her down so she was at my level mm -hmm. and i was like i noticed that was like wow that is really she is so good you mm -hmm. know i yeah. definitely felt so comfortable so yes like it i never thought to lower well my chairs in my office are they're not like office chairs they're like on the same size but mm -hmm. like i really want to think about this now what you're saying but I do like in terms of like my my reading room, like I make sure to always have chairs that don't have arms on them because I want people of every size to feel comfortable. Yeah. And I feel like they're have you know, I want people to feel that whoever you are and however I can accommodate you, like I'm trying to think ahead of that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. those little things matter, don't they? They do. They really do because it, it, it really is um – especially when you when you get to a place where you are reading comfortably for other people and you may have a reputation or they may have an expectation coming to you they really are looking at you um, like you possess some type of you know magical ability or some type of supernatural ability um, that that they don't have and I like to remind people that yes it, perhaps it is a supernatural or magical mm -hmm. ability but you have it too um, and it's just the case that I am further along down the path of having studied it or worked with it mm -hmm. in a way that I can, you know, do it for somebody, somebody else. So, um, yeah. I, yeah. I've definitely learned that I don't like open a reading room in, in the, the town I'm in mm. because I like, I like, I feel like I'm kinder, I'm a kindergartner teacher. Like if people catch me outside, yeah. like, <laughs> you're like I'm at like, the local oh. bar and you're like, oh, <laughs> like Miss Matlin was getting tipsy on the tequilas <laughs> last night. Right. I'm like, I'm at karaoke night. What? Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. Like, so that is, I definitely try to dispel that. Like, yeah, I do have this other, um, talent, but it's really no different than someone who can sing really well or someone who can right. carve really well. And like, I'm still human, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I, I'm so excited for this conversation. I could keep going on forever, but I've held you for so long already. Um, I, I, I do want to just take a, a second again, just to say to you that I think, uh, will you give me a reading is a, just a very needed and wonderful addition to the world of books on tarot. It's unique, it's different. And I think that, um, to tackle the particular specific question of how do you actually go out there and read for others in the environment that we're in right now with the you know hyper glamorization of reading and all of the the abundance of the scam artists and all of that i really think you are the best person to have written this book and you approach the topic in the best way and um and i feel that way like only being halfway through so I'm, I'm so excited to finish it and um, excited to share it with folks and I encourage everyone who's listening watching get your hands on a copy I've listed it in my Amazon storefront for convenience for my folks who know where to go for my my book recommendations um, but it, it became available on the 8th of November so it is available now and you can go ahead and get yourself a copy and I encourage even if you are not planning on becoming a reader for others or anything like that this book I think will help you uh, go from my tarot deck sits on my shelf and every once in a while I look at it and I wish I understood it better um, to I now have a practice of reading for myself regularly and I understand um, why uh, I have been called to this particular type of tool so get yourself uh, a copy of this book for sure um, 
Thank yeah. you for such generous and kind words. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I absolutely. They come from the top of my heart, as I have been saying lately. Um, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I heard someone say that, and I was like, I'm jacking that <laughs> <laughs> from the top of my heart. Um, mm. Before I let you go, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, just sharing with folks maybe uh, where they can find you, where they can keep in touch, where they can hear uh, some of these great um, talks that you have been doing about uh, tarot reading and stay in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. So you can find me uh, on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, all on my name. Jenna Matlin is the name of my handle. You can also find me uh, at jennamatlin.com. Um, there is also willyougivemeareading.com. And if you go to that page, um, I have a little newsletter um, automation set up where I have some really cool little extras. Um, if people, you know, leave a little review, I will send you one of the cut chapters from this book that I was like, no, and I cut it. But, you know, like Llewellyn's like, this is a little real. And I was like, all right, but if you like real. <laughs> yes, um, I will be signing up <laughs> for yes, that, and, yes. And then starting in January, uh, the last Wednesday, it's a Wednesday afternoon, um, but, I will be doing a free book club. So save your lunch hour for three, come and hang out and it's free. We're just going to chat. Um, and there's going to be more stuff going on, but that's, that's really where I'm at with things right now. So. Okay. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's cool. Yeah. We, um, my coven has a book club and it has been really awesome reading with other folks and not feeling like you're by yourself in your interests and, uh, just having other people to throw ideas mm -hmm. off of or, um, talk about things with. So, um, folks definitely make sure to stay in touch with Jenna, follow her on all the socials, check out the website. Um, so that you can participate in all of the things that she's got coming up. So I just want to thank you so much for being with us. It's been such a pleasure having you as our guest co-host for this episode of the Better Witch podcast on being a better tarot witch. And uh, remember, guys, when we know better, we witch better. See you Ooh, next week. I like that. Thank you, witches, for tuning in to another episode of the Better Witch podcast presented by the Modern Witch Network. New episodes air every week. Watch the video broadcast on YouTube every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern or listen to the audio version on your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. And if you're a Bronx Witch Coven member, join us right after each YouTube broadcast for a live Q&A about the episode. Whether you're watching on YouTube or tuning in on your favorite podcast platform, we want to know your thoughts on today's episode. So please make sure to leave reviews and drop comments wherever you are. You can show support for this podcast by grabbing some sweet merch and join the Bronx Witch Coven on YouTube for behind the scenes footage from today's episode and the details to join in on those live Q&As. See you next week and blessed be. Mm -hmm.